finish our series, Live Free. Um, it's been really exciting going through the book of Galatians. Even some like real life Galatians applications right here after service one of the Sundays. I was like, wow, this is really neat, God. Um, but I'm excited about Galatians chapter 6 today because if we're talking about uh, Capital City Church, that we want to be a family of servant missionaries, I think there's some insight in chapter 6 that's going to be really important for us to follow. You're like, oh, yeah, of course, every week I probably said that. I'm like, yeah, every week I probably said that. But this week, again, it was another one that I'm like, yes, if, if we want to be this family of servant missionaries, man, this is going to be something that has to be true of us. That uh, if, if we want to be a place that, that people come and find restoration, they find salvation, that their lives are restored, and this is going to be important information. So we're in Galatians chapter 6 this morning, and I'm going to read verse uh, part of verse 1 before we pray for the message. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit, or some may say you who are spiritual, should restore them. Others say that they would restore the person gently. Let's pray this morning. Father, we're grateful for your word. We thank you that you have made your word known to us this morning. We thank you that you've uh, given us your spirit that speaks truth, that reminds us of everything that you've said to us. God, I pray that as we hear your message this morning, that it would um, pierce our hearts, God, that it would change us, that it would cause us to look more and more like you. Father, we thank you that you have dedicated this place, you've dedicated this family of believers to be a place of restoration. God, I pray that we would take heed to these words, and God, they would transform us, that we would continue to see restoration happen here at Capital City Church. Yes. Father, we thank you for that. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Galatians uh, 6, 1, we've been talking this whole message that Paul was writing to the, the church in, uh, in, in Galatia was all about these religious people that had come, and they were trying to put rules and laws on the people, trying to get the, the church there to follow the religious rules, especially the Jewish calendar and, thing, and circumcision. And um, as we're moving through this, he brings up some other points here in Galatians chapter 6 about restoration. And so if we're going to be a, a people that we're going to live free, we're going to be people of restoration, it's going to be important for us to remember, hey, we, that it's not it's not a law or a rule based things. It's a it's a thing of grace. It's a thing of the gospel, and the gospel has to be the central part of who we are because then it's going to affect everything we do and how we interact with everybody who comes in our in our path, whether it be in our workplace, in our family, in every situation. So so it opens up here really great. And then, brother and sister, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore them, and restore that person specifically. It says gently. See, our goal, uh, I love this, but that, our, that our goal in a situation like this is restoration. I was reminded as I was reading about the woman who was caught in adultery in John chapter 8. You guys remember that story? So the religious leaders of that day had, uh, had, had caught a woman in adultery. Now, some people would kind of theorize and say, oh, maybe, maybe they had even set up the situation or, in some way. But they, in, any, in any case, they caught a woman in adultery. And they come and they bring her before Jesus, and they want to test Jesus. What is Jesus going to do? This woman is caught in sin. There needs to be something done. And all the religious leaders knew that the law at that point had said, yeah, we should stone her. So they all were prepared. They want to stone this person to death. And Jesus caught in this situation. The religious leaders all around, the woman caught in adultery. It makes a really easy, a really, a really simple statement, but it's huge when we're talking about restoring a sinner, restoring somebody that has sinned. He goes, you that cast the first stone, or you, you, that, have the, you that have not sinned, cast the first stone. And I'm thinking, wow. Nobody would qualify. Right? And that's what, exactly what happened. So each one, one by one, or, or has a few at a time, dropped their stones and they walked away. They left the, the woman there that was caught in adultery with Jesus. And Jesus asked me, where has your accusers gone? And in this picture of Jesus interacting with this woman, you know, he's riding on the ground, and there's all sorts of different people that had different theories of what he was riding on the ground, but 
doesn't say what he was writing. But afterwards, he, he looks at her, asks her, where's your accusers gone? They had all disappeared. But he, and then he tells her, go and sin no more. Your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. When we're talking about restoration of a sinner, um, sometimes as a, as a minister, or even, you know, in, again, we, in this church view, all of us as ministers, we're all ministers of the gospel, right? So in these moments of ministry, in these moments of opportunity to lift somebody up, you know, sometimes we take the stands and, you know, just like a religious person, we'll get angry, we get upset, and, and Paul in a couple of verses here is going to upset that, or he's going to address that. Why do people get upset, or why, what's that, what's that trigger in us that when somebody falls that we want to, we want to one-up them, right? We want to be just like the religious leader sometimes, pick up that stone, hey, this is what you deserve. And, and I think maybe it's the fault of us as fault as the church in general, the church of God in general, uh, around the, the world, maybe in the U.S., that we have, again, taken that stance with the religious leaders in that moment. That when somebody is down, then we try to pound them, or we reject them, or we leave them out. But there's a the key thing here that Paul addresses. He says, uh, those who are caught in sin, those who live by the Spirit. So we talk about the book of Galatians, where we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit that was evidence in their life. So those who are led by the Spirit, those who live by the Spirit, those who have the fruit of the Spirit in their lives, you need to renew your story. You need to gently lift up the person that has been caught in sin right. and restore them. So this is, the, this is why the message of Galatians is so important. Because if, it's, if we do not live with the fruit of the Spirit inside of us, then those moments that we have opportunity to lift somebody up, we miss those. Because we don't have the fruit of the Spirit. We aren't living by the Spirit. So it's, it's an important note again that Paul ties in this live by the Spirit while we're restored. <coughs> because, here, let's, um, I, wrote, I wrote a note real quickly. It said, uh, nothing reveals the wickedness of religious rule enforcers better than the way religious rule enforcers treat those who have sin. Mm, same thing. Good. Nothing reveals the wickedness of religious rule enforcers better than the way religious rule enforcers treat those who have sinned. Yes. Sometimes we want to we want to stick to the rules. Oh, you broke this rule, so you get this, right? I am sometimes. I've been in that situation. Maybe, maybe you, maybe, maybe you, maybe not in a church setting. Maybe you have children in your home, right? And and they've broken the law, and they're like, "This is the punishment for that situation." This is how it's going to be. Maybe you're in a work situation, right? And you and somebody in your workplace has has robbed you, and you're like, "Okay, now this is the penalty for this situation. This is, this is what we need to do. Get out the stones. Let's go. Let's get this right." Maybe you've been crossed in some uh, life situation, right? And you know that person has wronged you, and you, you're ready to, hey, let's lay down, this is what my right is by the law. So many times we forget what has been done to us. That's right. The gospel message is so essential. Right? That when we're in sinners, Christ died for us, that he shed grace on our lives instead of giving us what we deserve. I mean, I, I'm thankful over and over again for the grace of God in my life, the influence of God in my life, because then I know that apart from Jesus and His perfect uh, sacrifice that He's made, that I deserve death. Like, this is, the, this is the end result. And so, in this situation, He's talking to us when we find a brother that sinned, those who are spiritual, those who have the fruit of the Spirit in their life, we should, we should lift them up, we should restore them gently. Why? Because it's the same thing that has been done to me. Amen. To you, to each one of us. So when we, when we understand this, then our position, when, when we're in this position, where we've been wrong, where other people are wrong, where there's law against it, we say, no, the same grace has been applied to me, I'm going to give to you. And so if we at Catholic City Church wants to be this family of restoration, right, then we got to remember, be on the forefront of our mind, what has been done to us first? Through Jesus. And then we can, again, restore somebody. What is it? I mean, restoration, what does that look like? What is restoring when we're talking about when a sinner sins? Is it just taking them back to the, the place where they've been before? When we talk about um, in Romans chapter 1, verses 16, it says that the, um, that the gospel is, uh, is salvation for all those who believe. 
the gospel of God is the power of salvation for all those who believe. The, the word salvation there is also this uh, also can be is interpreted as uh, restoration, it's, it's rebuilt, it's totally, totally restored. In this verse one here, here, we're only in verse one. There's so much here. But this restoration is that we're we're not just bringing them back to a point of, okay, they've confessed their sin, they repented of their sin, but it's it's the willingness of these people who are spiritual to walk with that person to full wholeness. So it's not just a, okay, we've got this situation, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the moment with the adultery woman, okay, your sins are forgiven, okay, that would have been, that would have been enough, right? They said, no, there's also a life change, okay, go and sin, sin no more. Where right here in Galatians, it's our responsibility also that we walk alongside with this person and make sure, hey, that it's not just a moment of repentance, but it's a moment that the, that the repentance is lived out in their lives. We're going to restore them completely because we want them to get back to the place right. where they reflect the glory of God. It's, it's not enough just that, okay, we, we have made our lives right, but that also their life <coughs> reflects yes. the glory, that the fruit of the Spirit is also in their life. And sometimes that takes a little longer than just a one-moment conversation, right? Come on. That's right. So we have one-moment conversation, okay, they're in a bit of God, but no, it takes a, a, a path point. So we go spiritually. Those who have the fruit of the Spirit flowing in their lives, let's walk alongside those that we find in, in the fall, those who we have found that have sin, those who we see sin, let's walk along them so that they may be restored, fully restored. This is the next one, this is the second part of verse 1. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. I'm going to read through verse 3 here. Uh, but watch yourself, you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something, when they are not, they are de they are deceiving themselves. Yes. So I was thinking about this, but watch, but watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. And I thought there's good wisdom, there's great wisdom that I've heard from that verse before. You know, when you're working with people who are in sin, they were talking about um, maybe some big sins, like they're out like prostitution or or things of that nature. You say, okay, there's a warning here. Be careful. Okay? Okay, be careful. We, we know that there's people in the city that are, uh, we can say even there's different strip clubs that I know in the, the city of Madison. And so, hey, as a, as a believer, I want to see those people saved. But hey, there's a warning for us if we're going to go and, and take part in restoring that part of Madison. Hey, okay, be careful. There's some, there's some warning there, some wisdom in that. But I think there's a, also there's a deeper uh, warning here that Paul's pointing out. Watch yourself, or you may be tempted. Because he goes in uh, verse 3, he says, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Yeah. This, is a, this is a big warning. So it's not just that, okay, be, be careful that, okay, when you find a brother or sister that has sinned, be careful that you don't fall into the same sin. But it's be careful that you don't find yourself in a position of pride over the person that has fallen. That's right. Because that's the, that's, if, if we're saying we're going to be a family that brings restoration to people's lives and brings restoration to each other, bring restoration in our family, bring restoration in Madison, we can't take the position that we're better than the person that has fallen. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Be careful that you don't deceive yourself and say, oh, I'm not subject to that same sin. No, the, 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 the understanding of the gospel says, no, I know I'm just as, I am just as um, uh, deceptible, right, um, to that sin. Acceptable. Such a sin. Deceptible, right? That sin can easily have tripped me up also. So I'm going to help build you up. I'm not going to be in a position of lordship over you. Oh, you felt that that had never happened to me, so I'm just going to help you out. I'm going to do something good for you. No, I'm going to take a position of, of humility and say, no, I'm going to get down with you. I'm going to lift you up. Why? Because you guys, this is, this is how dangerous it is. It's the same position that Satan put himself in. Verse, verse 3. If anyone thinks they are something, when they are not, they deceive them. Not like Satan to you, <coughs> and Jesus, it, Lord God, you're giving all this worship. I, I think I deserve some worship. I think I'm, 
I'm not the best angel around. I can bring the best music to you. They're like, I think I deserve some of this too. He sought something of himself that he wasn't. And it deceived himself. And now he has a fallen angel. The whole, whole sin issue is all because somebody decided, hey, I got to think better of myself. And it deceived him. And it's still, it's, it's still the sin that he did. It's deception. But we have to be careful as we're in this process of restoration that we don't find ourselves in the same position of deceit. That we think we're better than the one that has fallen. No, we're just as susceptible to sin as they were. You led by the Spirit and you lift them up. Now we're right in the middle of those two verses is, is verse 2. Carry each other's burdens in this way and you will fulfill the law of Christ. We've talked about a, a pastor in class message was one of the two basic laws of Christ, right? Love God, so we have this love relationship with Him, and we're getting all our pieces in with Him. And then the next thing is love each other as yourself. So we're talking about burdens. That, uh, we're talking about other burdens here, especially this word burdens, burdens that are overwhelming to somebody. So we know that as believers, Christ has given everybody a way of escape. There's nothing that's going to tempt us that we that that Christ has not overcome already, and that He has not given us a way of escape. But they find sometimes in some moments. There's a burden that overwhelms us. It's too much for us to carry. Man, we're not going to think more highly than us. We're not going to think too highly of ourselves. And we're going to go and we're going to serve that person. We're going to help carry their burdens. We're going to help walk them through. Let's find out what, what is the root cause of this issue in your life. Is it just the outward act of this sin or this situation? Or is there something deeper? Let's, let's dive into this. Let's bring some restoration into your core that the fruit of the Spirit can can happen. We're partnering with the work of the Holy Spirit in others' lives. So watch ourselves that we aren't tempted to take a position of pride, but we should carry one another burdens. We should submit ourselves we humbly, lift each other up, especially when burdens overwhelm each other. Mm-hmm. If anyone thinks we're highly, we deceive ourselves. Deceit is the hardest thing. Because when you're deceived, you don't know it. That's right. I'm just thinking, like, I don't, even, I don't even know I'm wrong. I'm just doing what I think is right. And then, uh, so that's why we need each other. We need a family. We need the Holy Spirit. We need somebody in our body. We need to be spiritually aware, or what is, what does it say, of people who live by the Spirit, right, in verse 1. We need that in our body so that there is somebody that say, hey, the, hey, maybe the, you've been, not been listening to the Spirit, but this is what the Spirit is saying. I'm discerning something about this situation. Verse 4. Oh, before I go to the what would it look like? We're talking about carrying each other's burdens. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says this that we should esteem others higher than ourselves. So, this church, uh, the church in general, maybe has gotten this wrong, right? That we kind of take the religious side of picking the stones and beating people up that have sinned, right? What would it look like if everybody in the, the call of the Christian actually looks up to everybody else? That's what, that's, what, that's what this is a picture of. Paul's famous picture here in Galatians, also in Philippians. That we should esteem others higher than ourselves. Those who have sent me in the Lord are like, wow, I... I don't see you when you're sin. I actually see you how Christ sees you. And it's way better than what, what you are right now. But I'm going to help you get to that point. And I, I want to help them. I want to help. I want to I want to help Jesus. I want, I want to help Could I, I esteem you higher than myself? That's what, it, that's what this is describing here. We don't think of ourselves too highly or something that we aren't. Man, we're people that look up to each other. We just constantly look up to each other. Could you imagine what that does to a, uh, to a culture? We've made a culture that they were always looking up to each other. Yeah, make you you great. You got it. You got it. That's what it's going to take for us to see restoration, for us to live free, for us to live away from these law based things that get us so messed up. That we're going to see grace. We're going to have to start looking up to each other and say, hey, God, I've seen you. You're, you're, you're great. You're awesome. Mm-hmm. I see how Christ sees you. Each one should test their own actions. Then 
they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Four and five. Come on. All right, Paul, you're doing it again. Saying one thing, and then you're switching it up here. You ever, you ever think about that sometimes? Like, yeah. It just said, verse, three, verse two, carry each other's burdens. Then verse four or five flips the switch a little bit. But I, that's, why, that's why we get together so we can examine this. Each one should test their own actions. They can take, uh, so they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. That's what we just said, called the pride of Adam, right before this. Now you're saying, okay, take pride in what you're doing. We're talking, and Paul here, he's taking, he's uh, focusing on, I put on here, testing ourselves. We've got to be honest with ourselves. It comes with this, hey, that we're all susceptible to the same thing, right? So we've got, to te- we've got to be honest with ourselves. We've got to examine ourselves. And know where we're at. Yeah. Yeah, this is the issue of sometimes we think too highly of ourselves. Sometimes we're not honest with ourselves. Yeah, actually, I do have an issue with this thing. Yeah, I do I get frustrated about this situation. Yeah, this thing really does cause me to lie. This thing really does cause me to sin. And hey, actually, I, I am a little selfish in this area. And, and then it, it, we forget about that. So it says, test yourself. Because it will remind you that you're in the same boat. Yeah. Maybe, you're, maybe you're dealing with something else. But you're in the same boat. You still have a little sin issue. You're still not quite like Jesus yet. And again, this is changing our mind. It's putting us in the mindset of the gospel where, hey, the gospel says, man, it, I was sinful, but Christ died for me while I was at that state. And so when he did that for me, well, and I received an amazing gift. And so when I'm looking at others in the same situation, man, I'm going to have that same attitude. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm just as weak as they are. Maybe they're evident. Maybe they're sinful. Evident. This, this moment. Maybe maybe I could see this more often. But test yourself. Then they can take pride in themselves alone. So it's good to rejoice. Man, after the fruit of the Spirit is evident in my life right now. That's a really good man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rejoice. I'm gonna take pride in the fact that, yeah, Rachel and I are where we used to be five years ago. I'm not the same, I'm not the same person. There is some progress in my life. There is things that God is doing. I'm going to rejoice and I'm not going to compare myself to another though. That's what I'm saying. Come on. I'm not going to say, yeah, but you know, hey, I heard a testimony last week, an amazing testimony of where God is, but Dion and Ashley aren't standing in a position of, oh, yeah, but I'm not like that person anymore. No, it, not, that's, not what, that's not where you're testing yourself. In yourself, you say, wow, God, thank you that, I, that I'm making progress to look more like you. That your glory, the, the character of God, is more evident in my life today than it was before. Yes. And then my prayer is always, I thank you that it's not where it was before, that it's more evident in my life today. And help me next week, help me today, help me tomorrow to look even more like you. Yes. And if I'm, making, and if I'm going through that journey, then I can say, hey, brother, and sister, who's also in sin, let me help, let me help build you up, let me... Let me share with you. Let me lift you up. Let's let's go together towards restoration, towards looking more and more like the Father. Praise the Lord. So you, you, not, you take pride in yourself. You rejoice in what, what's happening inside of you, but you're not comparing yourself to yourself to anybody else because the, the only comparison that we have is to Christ. And get, you know, we know we know we don't look like Christ yet. We got to be honest in that moment. If not. If you don't know that, you're, you're deceived. And we didn't have to work on that, right? But, we, but I think we're all aware. Yeah, we don't quite look like Jesus yet. And we need to, we need to work, continue to work toward that. The verse, uh, verse 5. For each, <clears throat> for each one should carry their own burdens. Now I was looking at this, and I have that, I'm have reading that in the NIV. And when I read it in the NIV, I was like, okay, but maybe um, I'm not quite sure what it's talking about. It just told me, carry the other burdens. Right? And now I should each carry my own burden. So I wasn't sure about this. And I started looking at the Greek a little bit and, and dissecting it. And it's talking about the burden. So there's a difference in the two words of burdens. Uh, I'll point that out. Um, in, verse, uh, in verse 2, it's an overwhelming burden. Something that has caught you, that's destroyed you. 
And then there's a burden that is like a load, like a backpack load or burden that you're carrying when you go backpacking. I don't know, um, Dad, when he was in the military, he used backpack and he used big old load to have to, you know, do when he was doing physical training kind of stuff, right? So this load, though, is it, it, when what look even further. Um, for each one, should carry its own bone load. I had this really awesome opportunity in college to take some Greek classes, and I and I took, you know, I'm not saying I'm an expert in Greek by any means, but some of the times when you look at the Greek participles, you can see um, some changes, but. And depending on how the Bible is interpreted or which version you're using, they interpret it either word for word or thought for thought. So sometimes that's where you see these differences in, in wording here. But one should carry their own burden. And it, it's talking about or you could also put in there, one will carry his own burden. But this is, when you're studying this out, it says that Paul is referring here not to your current place where you're at, okay, you're carrying your own burden. But when we stand before God in judgment, we will carry our own burdens. So how does this fit into what Paul is saying here? Because one, as we're living together, I see a brother or sister that has a heavy burden on them. I want to help them and I want to carry them along with them. But he talks about, hey, be careful, be honest with yourself, test yourself, because there's going to come a day where you're going to have to carry your own burden. You're going to be accountable for what you've done. You're going to be accountable for the sins that you have. So you're helping each other out. But we know that our, we work on our salvation with fear and trembling because one day I myself is going to stand before God. I'm going to be with this is a spiritual sister or brother that's helped me. It's going to be myself before God, and He's going to say, "Hey, these are the things you've done," and and say, "Hey, has the blood of Christ been applied to your life? If it has, I'm glad there's, there's grace going to, and mercy going to flow on me in that moment. But I haven't. That those burdens that I carry, the sins that I commit, those sins that are of mine." I want to have them before God. The test yourself. Make sure you're right before God. Because you do carry the burden of your own sins. But you're also going to be a good brother and sister. You're going to carry the burden of others and help them through it so that restoration and the character of God will be revealed in their lives. So, for, for we will carry our own burden, our own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction from the Word should share all good things with their instructor. And this is why I love Sunday mornings, I love missional community, I love when we come together. Because then, it's, then we can really have, if we follow this verse, we see this verse inside of us, we can really have a celebration service when we get together. Because on Sunday morning, instead of it being a terrible time when we're like, oh, this is burning, we can come and say, guess what God did this week? And we're going to share the good things that God has done in our lives. Okay? Hey, brother, you helped me out with this. And guess what? I, I was following this out, and this is the fruit that it's producing in my life. These are the good things. Share all good things with the instructors. Those who have helped guide you through, those who are, are walking you through the situation, you're going to share the good thing that God's doing in your life. Like last week, we have a whole service just about a testimony. God's doing this in our life. This is exciting. Let's do it. Share the good things that are happening with those that have instructed, those that have carried you through. One who receives instructions in the Word should share all the good things so that we can have a time of celebration. Celebrate what God is doing. The good things that are evident in our lives. Alright, so verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as an therefore we have an opportunity. Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So seven. 7 through 9 here. I was talking with Dad this week as, as I was doing some studies. And, you know, again, I don't know why the body of Christ has gotten so mixed up anytime we talk about sowing and reaping. And everybody always goes to finances. And I was looking at commentaries and I was like, why do you guys talk about finances? Like, that doesn't even fit what Paul's talking about here. I had a, a good teacher um, 
mentor Linda Perdue, and she she would say this. She would maybe summarize this whole thing and say this. She said, "Whatever you feed grows." A really important principle when we're talking about lending. Talk about the garden. You're gardening this summer. You got tomato plants. If you don't feed them, they're not going to grow. But if you do feed, it does grow. You got a weed growing up, and you're like just feeding all the weeds and all the right. In the spirit realm and in the spirit, when we're walking with Christ, the same thing applies. Whatever you feed is going to grow. If you're going to sow to this flesh, if you're going to do things with flesh, you it selfishly, or we talk about um, this list of this list of crazy sins in, in the previous chapter, right? I didn't have this marked, so I'm looking back here. Here we go. Acts of the flesh are obvious: sexual immorality, purity. Debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. If you're so into these fleshly things, your fleshly desires, guess what? They're going to grow. It goes back to this honest thing. Be honest with yourself. Test yourself. Are you feeding these things? If you're wondering, why is the fruit of the Spirit not in my life? Why am I not gentle? Why am I... Why am I not at peace? Why do I not have love flowing from me? Why? Why? Is it, and then you're just feeding these fleshly things. It's going to grow in your life. And this is a, this is a basic principle. But he said, man, if I, want to, if I want the character of God, if I want to pursue God, if I want the character of God to be in my life, if I want the, the presence of God, if I want all of his good, if I, if I examine it, am I feeding my, am I fit? Speed in my spirit, my free time, what am I doing? How am I spending time? I gotta be I gotta be cautious of that myself. My free time, what am I doing? Am I entertaining a weird thing on the internet? Am I what am I watching in the TV? And I know these things typically in the past have been legalistic, but I'm saying there's just let's let's be truthful, let's let's examine it. Hey, I gotta feed my spirit. And some of these things are feeding my flesh. I wanna be a person that's full of the spirit. How can I feed that? Because whoever sows to feed their flesh will from the flesh reap destruction. Hard words, Paul, Jesus, Holy Spirit this morning. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. But sometimes we see in different situations, we see the result of feeding to the, sowing to the flesh. You know, we talk about when we catch a brother, catch a sister in sin, it's usually not that, that moment. Uh, another thing Lindy used to say all the time, nobody, nobody wakes up one morning and all of a sudden says, hey, I want to go out and murder someone today. It's usually a, it's something that has been Fed into them over and over again. They made compromises, little compromises, over and over again. Nobody wakes up one morning and says, hey, "I'm going to destroy my family today by committing adultery." It's not something that happens in the in, in the moment. There's things that have been so into you, the, into it. We're going to talk about being a spiritual family. There's things that are so into it. There isn't great men of men and women of God. There's no shortcut to great men and women of God that we've seen over history. You say, "Hey, man, this this person is like." Full of spirit, you've seen thousands saved and healed all over the place. Their their lives are so blessed by God. It doesn't just happen just by happenstance. It says, no, it's something that's been so into it. They they they've invested into it, and in the proper time, we reap a harvest. I love this little this little condition here because we know anybody that's been walking with the Lord for a while. Sometimes we all we experience this, right? Hey, where we are, man. We're, we've tested ourselves, we're honest with ourselves, yeah, I am, I'm in the Word, I'm like, I, I'm loving God, I'm praying, I'm fellowshipping with believers, and I still got this situation around.